Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, und willkommen to case study number 37, the infant with abdominal pain. You like my German there? All right. Uh, if you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. I really appreciate it. We have a 12-month-old white male infant being brought into the ED by his mother complaining of intermittent abdominal pain for four hours. The episodes last about 10 minutes and then they go away for about 30 minutes before they return. So this is colicky pain. It's not constant. It comes and goes. During the painful episodes, he will cry inconsolably, lay down, and pull his legs to his abdomen. So he's literally doubling over. Mom decided to bring the patient in when she noticed dark black stools in his diaper and an episode of vomiting about an hour ago. She denies fever or changes to stooling. Prenatal birth and postnatal history are uncomplicated. He was born at term. No significant past medical history, no siblings, no medications, tracking fine, up to date on all vaccinations, vitals, 81 over 57, low normal, heart rate 155, elevated, respirations 48, normal, temperature 98.2, normal. Got to know your normal vitals for pediatric patients. They are different from adult patients. Okay, what are we going to do for physical exam? Um, so we'll be pretty comprehensive, but the important parts here are the abdomen and rectal exam, obviously. So he is fussy, skin is fine, H-E-N-T is fine, heart and lungs are fine, abdomen. Cries on palpation of the right upper quadrant particularly. There's some fullness to palpation, reduced bowel sounds, and the liver and spleen are not palpable. Rectal exam. Always do the rectal exam when you've got a patient with GI symptoms. Normal sphincter tone, small amount of deep maroon stool, occult positive. So we have bloody stools. Extremities, no cyanosis or edema. Okay, so we have a patient with abdominal pain, bloody stools, and vomiting. And there's something going on in the right upper quadrant. What are you going to do? Well, first of all, let's figure out our differential for a child, an infant with abdominal pain. Intussusception needs to be on your differential because it's a very common cause of abdominal pain, of colicky abdominal pain in an infant. Very, very common. We can also think of bacterial gastroenteritis. That will give you bloody stools and abdominal pain, and it can give you throwing up. So we're talking of salmonella and shigella. We're not thinking viral here. Urinary tract infection can cause abdominal pain, but it's not going to cause bloody stools, and the same with acute appendicitis. So we're going to get a CBC and a BMP, and we're going to get an abdominal ultrasound because our number one in our differential is intussusception, and this is the best test to diagnose that. CBC and BMP are within normal limits, and the abdominal ultrasound shows the target sign of the bowel over the right upper quadrant. So this is a um, this is what you're going to see, by the way. Um, so this is kind of hard to see, but you can see right here, and I hate that I use black here, uh, but you can see the outer portion of the bowel, and then you've got this telescoping portion right here where it kind of pushes inward. This is the target sign. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the dome donut sign, um, or, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of names, um, bullseye. Um, so uh, this is what you will see in, if you do an ultrasound uh, in intussusception. And oftentimes with intussusception, you can feel a mass. That's where you're going to do your ultrasound. Okay, this is another picture here, a couple of them. So that's just for your information. So our initial orders are going to be to tend to the patient, obviously. That's the most important part. Um, so we want to make sure that we're providing the patient with fluids. This is a patient who's got diarrhea, who's throwing up, who's not feeding. And so there's a risk of hypotension. Um, so we need to give IV fluids. Patient's going to be NPO. 
Well, why are they NPO? Because they have essentially a blockage. And so we don't want to be giving food um, when, when that's happening. And then we want to give IV painkillers because this patient is in pain. Okay, now the treatment is a barium enema. Now, why do we do a barium enema? Well, it's both diagnostic and therapeutic. Now, when would we not do a barium enema? We would not do a barium enema if there are signs of peritonitis. Now, what are the signs of peritonitis? Well, they may have a fever. They may have diffuse abdominal pain with guarding. Sometimes they will have discoloration over their abdomen. And that CBC, they'll probably have a high white count. So taking all those into consideration, you have to decide whether you think this is peritonitis or not. If you think it is, you're going to go for surgical management. Now, another reason you may go with surgical management is if they are septic, if they're unstable. Um, or you may do it if you feel there may be a perforation. Uh, and if you think there may be a perforation, you need to get an abdominal x-ray because that will show the free air much better than the ultrasound will. Subsequent orders after the uh, barium enema is performed and it's typically successful, you will admit the patient for 12 to 24 hours of observation and advance to a liquid diet. And if everything is good after 12 to 24 hours, you can send the patient home. So when do we consult pediatric surgery? Surgery is second line. Well, as mentioned, if there's signs of peritonitis or perforation, if the patient is unstable, or if the barium enema doesn't work. Intussusception is a telescoping prolapse of one segment of bowel into the distal bowel. So you've got a telescoping. The most common location is in the ileocecal region, and this will be appreciated in the right upper quadrant. The most common cause of bowel obstruction in the first two years of life is intussusception, and in infants and toddlers under two or three years of age, uh, it's idiopathic in most cases. In older children and adults, usually it's associated with some sort of lead point, so it's a structural abnormality. If you're dealing with a two-year-old, really think about Meckel's diverticulum. It tends to present at that age. If you're dealing with someone older, think of maybe an enlarged lymph node or a tumor. Also think of the possibility of henoch schönlein purpura. Remember, that's a vasculitis. You've got inflammation of the vessel wall. What can happen is that can essentially serve as the lead point. So there is an association between HSP and intussusception. The classic triad is abdominal pain, vomiting, and bloody stools in a young child. Bloody stools are often described as current jelly. This is not step one. They're not going to tell you current jelly. What they'll tell you is maybe a, a maroon colored mucusy stool. They'll describe current jelly, but they won't use the term. Another term you get thrown around is sausage-like mass. Again, they're not gonna use that. What they may tell you is that there is a palpable mass in the right upper quadrant or periumbilical, and sometimes they'll even tell you that it's fluctuant. The diagnosis is abdominal ultrasound. It's the best initial and most accurate imaging test. However, the most accurate test overall is the barium enema. The treatment is immediate reduction with barium enema, provided that the patient is stable. If the patient is unstable, you can try to stabilize them, typically with fluids, manage the pain. Uh, if you can't stabilize them, you're going to send them off for emergent surgery. If a perforation is, is suspected, get an abdominal x-ray, administer antibiotics, and consult surgery for reduction. Antibiotics that are given when you suspect peritonitis are going to be broad spectrum. So think of like Piperacillin tazobactam is a really good antibiotic uh, for children uh, if you need to give something broad spectrum. Antibiotics are not indicated unless there is shock, perforation, peritonitis, or evidence of bowel wall necrosis. And that's unusual. That's only going to be in about 5, 6, 7% of patients, some, somewhere around there. Um, so most patients are uncomplicated. We don't need to give antibiotics. The complications, as mentioned, perforation, ischemia, and necrosis. 
this is a nice um, algorithm that I found online. You can print it out. The only thing that I would change here though is um, if the ultrasound is positive and it's an uncomplicated case, we're not going to give antibiotics. Um, so you would want to get rid of that. Okay. So some of the common differentials, bacterial gastroenteritis, um, you're not typically going to have an abdominal mass and the ultrasound will be negative. Urinary tract infection is not going to cause bloody stool, so that will be a way to rule that out. And then acute appendicitis, very rare in kids under 5, but it does cause us a similar pain profile. So um, often uh, what you may do here um, is take a look at that stool. It's almost always going to be occult negative. If it does come back occult positive, you will do your ultrasound, but um, this is typically not something we really consider in small children. So to recap, interception is a telescoping prolapse of one segment of small bowel into a distal segment. The most common location is in the ileocecal region. You'll appreciate this in the right upper quadrant. It's usually idiopathic in infants and toddlers. The triad is abdominal pain, vomiting, and bloody stool. Remember the buzzwords, but don't expect them. Diagnosis is abdominal ultrasound. You'll see the target sign or bullseye sign. The treatment, if it's uncomplicated, get the fluids uh, managed properly, get the pain under control, and get the barium enema done. That is therapeutic. If the barium enema fails, you'll send them off to pediatric surgery. If there are signs of perforation, peritonitis, or sepsis, know those signs. Get an abdominal x-ray, particularly if you're thinking of uh, a perforation, you'll be able to see the free air. Um, make sure you give IV broad spectrum antibiotics and then consult pediatric surgery. You'll observe these patients for 12 to 24 hours and advance their diet and discharge them once they are tolerating a normal diet.